magic detected. Right here. It's Gigi no Ri. No, 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 it's not Gigi no Ri. It's detect magic. And that slip of the tongue is fortuitous, my dear listener, because today this episode is going to be cross-posted to the Gigi no Ri feed and to detect magic, my personal podcast. And that person is Daniel Davis. Normally, I am the GM of Gigi no Ri, but I also have a solo podcast called Detect Magic, which you may not know about and you might like to listen to. And since I edit the episodes, I, I get this dispensation. I can put my own stuff on here. But it's not entirely self-indulgent because the thing I'm going to talk about today is something that we're going to be using in the GG No Re podcast. Right now, in the campaign I'm running, it's called Dungeon Academy. Go to gginorecast.com and you can see the episodes that we've posted so far. You know, I'll, I'll confess, it's been a bit slow. There's been fits and starts, but it's picking up speed, and I think the pure, white-hot vision of this campaign is going to come through and be enjoyed by many. At least me. I'm enjoying it. There's a win right there. Regardless, I was noodling on a little something. I wanted this campaign to have a mega dungeon set piece that the whole campaign revolves around, both fictionally and and on metagame level. And the other problem is that this campaign was designed to be a level zero campaign, like an extended funnel, where players who die in the dungeon get resurrected, like Dark Souls or something, because it's uh, like an illusion or a simulation or however you want to say it. I don't want to come down to specifics because there's lore behind the reason, no spoilers. But you know, and the, and the characters know that if they die in the dungeon, they'll, they'll come back and can try again in a week or so. The problem is, since they're level zero, they're not going to get any better. And how, how deep do I want to make this dungeon? Do I want to make it nine layers deep? So they're going to be fighting dragons at level zero? It's not going to happen. So they have to be able to advance in some other way. Especially because they're intended to go to the dungeon a lot. Like this is intended to be something you could play forever. There's the problem. We're not going to choose XP advancement because of just the concept of it being a, a school to teach you how to be a level one adventurer. So we've got to come up with some other way to make it survivable. Now, I had a couple options here. I could have them advance anyway. They could get up to level nine, but it's just uh, fake, right? It's just uh, in this simulation world where they're level nine. And when they come back out, they're level one when they graduate finally in the real world. But that doesn't seem to make sense. It seems like the experiences they have are still experiences that are no different if they were real versus if they were fake. So how to deal with it? I came up with this idea that I'm calling blood pools. Now, you may or may not have read the blog post I made about it. Probably most people didn't. It's very dry. I don't know of a way to make it interesting. I I probably could have put a uh, put a video with it that that might make sense because it's really not that complicated. And when I explain it to you, dear listener, I think you'll get it. I think a podcast is a fine method for delivering this info. So here it is. The point of the blood pool system is to provide an advancement track that's not XP based, that's system neutral, and it replicates things you see in fiction, especially D and D inspired fiction. For instance, the most famous thing now is Goblin Slayer, where it's D&D fiction where a guy only fights goblins, and he's really good at it. So we want to model players getting better at fighting particular monsters, like if they just want to fight goblins or kobolds, uh, as well as getting better generally, because you would imagine that fighting goblins over and over and over again would make you really great at fighting goblins, but also probably make you just good at fighting, period, but at a slower rate. So this does that, so it allows you to do that, and that's that's bolted on to even if you're doing a normal D&D game, where you get XP too. It doesn't matter if you're using XP for treasure, or XP for kills, or XP for hippie store game stuff, or milestones, or GM treats. It, it just works separate from all that. You can just modular, you just pop it in. And then it also does it in a way that doesn't affect any other game currency. It doesn't affect HP, AC, anything like that. So it tries to separate itself from contaminating any other reward systems or advancement tracks or statistics that you might be interested in manipulating in your own game or keeping pure. So here's how it works. Whenever you do damage to something or are damaged by that thing, you make a note of it and you keep track of it. There are lots of different variations that I spell out in the blog post, but let's just keep it simple for the audio version. You're in a fight, you're fighting some goblins. You do three damage to them over the course of the fight and you just track it with tally marks on scratch piece of paper or whatever and they do eight points of damage to you, and that's all you have to track, okay? The DM doesn't have to track this. It's up to each player to track it. Now, after the fight, we we see the blood. 
is to take a moment to imagine the scene, fictionally, where you're all either having run away or defeated your enemies, covered with the blood, wiping off your swords. It's a cool moment, and I think we need to dwell on those moments a bit to make things a bit more cinematic in our heads instead of just rushing through them, treating them as a, as a game object rather than as a, a fictional experience. So we have that tableau in our heads, and then the DM calls for the blood pool totals. The DM will have an entry list that has each monster type that was involved in the fight. Kobolds, bandits, goblins. Let's say there were three. Uh, in my case, I only dealt with the kobolds, let's say, and I did three damage to them and took eight damage from them. So I tell that to the DM, everyone else tells that to the DM, and then the DM has recorded per monster and total what the damage totals were. He doesn't care if they are damage received or damage dealt. All that matters is that you got some experience fighting the monsters as quantified by HP loss or uh, to yourself or to the monsters. Here's the first variation. You could make it so that you only get credit and get better at fighting if you were directly involved in doing the damage and receiving the damage, but I think that messes up with niche protection, and that's not the way XP works. So if you're a wizard in the back, you still get XP for fights and treasure in normal D&D, even though you may not have touched anything, but you're learning how to wizard better in these situations against these particular monsters. So that's how I've modeled this as well. So you tell the DM because he's going to average everything out. I may have uh, acquired 11 blood points in my fight on my scratch piece of paper, and my teammate may have acquired 38 but those are all added together and split by the number of characters in the party. So let's say I end up with 10 instead of 11 what I contributed. Maybe I'm a martial type, so I'm in the mix more. Okay, so I've got 10 points. Now we could just add this up to our blood pool limits and and go on from there, but I wanted to model something else as well because I didn't want the wizards getting the same amount of uh, fighty bonus stuff as the fighters do, because that doesn't make sense. They have other things. They find spell scrolls. They can learn new spells. They have other ways that are not XP to advance and get better. So I still wanted them to get better, but not at the same rate. So an easy way to do that is to multiply those points you get from the DM by something that has to do with your class. So the easy thing is by the max number of sides on your HD die. So in 5e, a fighter has a D10 HD. In old school D&D, it's a D8. Whatever. Doesn't matter. So I'd had my 10 blood points that the DM gave me that was averaged out among the party. I multiply that by 10 for my fighter because he has a D10 HD, whereas my cleric friend who has the D8 HD or D6 at full school would multiply by 8 or 6 depending on what the size of the HD is. And again, you can modify this. You could have the values. You can do whatever you want. You could just not even include this part and not multiply or adjust the values as they come in from the averaging. But do what you want. I think this makes more sense. Now, these again are for each entry. So if we, I fought multiple creatures in this fight and did damage or had damage done to me by them, I would do this for each one. So if the DM gave me 10 for kobolds, I'd multiply that by 10 to make 100. If I did 6 for goblins, that's 60 for the fighter, so forth. So I add each of these to the relevant monster entries that I keep on my character sheet or the DM can track it. I'm tracking it in my campaign electronically, so I don't have to make the players deal with this. And so when a monster comes up, the current totals are just listed on the monsters page in my software that I'm using, which is Notion, Notion notion.so. It's really good, you should do it. So that's how you track that. And then in addition, so in in our example here, I add that 100 points, so it's 10 from the DM, multiplied by 10 for my class, HD. So I've got 100 blood points for kobolds now. I add it to the entry for kobolds. I do the same thing for the general points. So any damage that you do versus any monster type gets added both to that monster type's entry and to the general pool. You compare this value against the size, or the limit, I should say, of the pool. So the general pool has a limit. By default, I set it at 100, but you can modify that as you wish. And then each monster entry has its own pool. You can standardize this as you wish, but I set it initially very low, so there would be rapid advancement at the max HP of each monster. So if you're doing 5e, just the standard HP of the monster. If you're doing basic D&D, you might want to do 8 if it has 1 HD, 16 if it has 2 HD, etc. Once your current blood points in this monster entry exceeds the limit that's currently set there. So for kobolds, let's say they have uh, 5 HP and 5e. So the limit starting would be 5. And once I've done more than that, which I did 100 in this case, which I don't know, may or may not be realistic, then I would increase that by a certain amount. So by default, I'm saying whenever you break the limit, double it. So if I broke the limit of five, which I did, I would have to double the limit until it was 10. And each time the limit is broken, you increase the amount in the blood pool for that entry. So each blood pool starts with zero, 
There's nothing in it. You don't get any bonuses versus the monster. And you have the current blood points for the sh versus the monster, which again starts at zero, but now is 100 for me in this example. And then the current blood pool limit, which is the number of HP to start with, which is five for this kobold. So every time I increase that limit, and I'm doubling it each time, I then increase the size of the pool. So I increase the limit from five to 10, and I correspondingly increase the pool from zero to one. I do that again from 10 to 20, from 20 to 40, 40 to 80, etc., increasing the amount in the pool each time. So at the end of this process, if I'd actually did get 100 blood points versus the kobolds, I might have four or five points in the blood pool. And of course, you do the same thing for the general limit. So in our case, we, we get 100 blood points for this fight total. We only fought one monster, so we had 100 for the kobolds. If I'd fought any other monsters, I'd add those blood points together to get the general blood points that I acquired for this fight. But in this case, of course, we just have 100. So we add that to the general blood pool points and turns out the limit by default is 100. So that breaks the limit and the limit doubles to 200. And anytime we break the limit, we increase the blood pool points. So that is one now general point. So as a result of this one fight, this hypothetical, I don't know if the numbers would work out in real life. We have one now in the blood point, general blood point pool, and we've got four or five for kobolds. So let's talk about what blood pools do. Whenever you get in a fight, you always have your general blood pool available. You start out with zero, but now in our case, there's one. So next time my fighter gets in a fight of any kind, I have that one general blood pool point to spend. If I get in a fight versus kobolds, then I've got all the kobold blood pool points as well. So they're not exclusive. You use them both together. By default, you use them to re-roll any relevant die. So if I'm rolling an attack versus the kobolds, then I can use my kobold blood pool points. If they're rolling attack versus me, I can do that as well. And so it doesn't matter if you're using it in attack or defense, as long as the monster you're using it against is relevant for the monster specific pools, you're good to go. And of course you can use the general blood pool points versus anything. And you can modify what these points do when you spend them, uh, if they give you multiple rerolls per point spent, whatever, you can, the sky's the limit. And a lot of variants are detailed on the blog post that's linked in the show notes. You can see how this would make your, your characters by default a lot more powerful, which is fine for me and in my case. You can tone this down if you want, or you might decide this is too much trouble to keep track of. I don't really think it's that big a deal. At most, you're going to need one more piece of paper, maybe two as the campaign goes on and you fight a bunch of unique monsters. But I think it adds uh, a little bit of fun, and you can incentivize grinding monsters a little bit to get better. You may or may not like that. I kind of like the idea and it doesn't mess with any other advancement track that you've got going in your system. So let us know what you think in the comments. Feel free to send in a voicemail. On to Tech Magic, I probably won't play listener voicemails. I do listen to them, and I may respond to them. But in general, I don't think it's a good idea to just play a bunch of voicemails in your podcast. I think it's boring. Most people want to hear you talk and not random people. But that's for another time. Hope you enjoyed this. Uh, we may revisit this once it actually gets used in play in the campaign, which should be pretty soon. Uh, the next session is going to come up probably this week, so expect another GG No Re episode about this, or where you have actual play, where the system is in play, uh, in the next week or so, and we'll see. Don't forget to check the blogs, detectmagic.wordpress.com, ggnorecast.com for the sister podcast. Hope you found it magical, but you, dear listener, certainly detect magical to me. <laughs>